Good morning, everyone. This is Bro Diallo. Happy Tanzanian Independence Day. Today on is December 9th in the year of your Lord, 2019. On this day in history, Tanzania, well, there, it's kind of disputed. Some people say Tanzania got its liberation in 1961, but some people don't count until the two nations, Zan Zanzibar and Takania, were united to form Tanzania. So there's a bit of a historical dispute. I say 1964 when Tanzania, the actual, instead of the territories, um, Tanzania was united, ter I mean, decolonized territorially. But I would say that, um, that um, Tanzania became liberated when Tanzania actually became a nation as opposed to, uh, disparate territories. So um, we had uh, some Tanzanian music um, to celebrate with our brothers and sisters on the continent. Tanzania was liberated by revolutionary Pan-Africanist who embarked on a campaign to create an East African Federation to unite with the African diaspora and West and South African uh, decolonization struggles to create a regional superpower. This is a history that is overlooked. Great Britain, with the help of Israel and the United States, intervene to stop this move to unite nations such as Kenya and Tanzania and Zimbabwe, formerly Rhodesia. Um, this is a history of, of, we talk about decolonization, we talk about black power and even the civil rights struggle, but I don't think we spend enough time talking about the forces of subversion of our struggles. And I, I, and I just have to say it, I think understanding how our struggles were subverted, having an in-depth struggle, understanding of the subversion of black liberation, black decolonization, black empowerment struggles is more important than celebrating the successes. Researching and studying the failures and researching the psychology and motivation of our enemy serves us better. And I, I don't discount the celebrations, but I don't think that the celebrations should overshadow the subversions. But again, that's just the Grinch in me. Um, but I think it would better serve us, better inform our actions. Because I don't think enough African people really understand the road to freedom even. Even though we celebrate our decolonization, our emancipation, uh, civil rights reforms, even though we celebrate these, these historical events, I do, when I engage with people, I don't think that they fully understand what it took. There are some people who really think that black people got off the, uh, we were freed with the Emancipation Proclamation and then the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which granted us citizenship, which granted us full protection and rights under the Constitution. There are some black people, black conservatives, believe that that was it. People like Bill Cosby 
believe that was it. There was nothing left for us to unite, struggle, complain about. Some black people say, well, maybe we didn't get it in 19, in 1869 with the ratification of the slave amendments, but they would argue, and then you can go back as far as even in the 50s and 40s, even in the 1890s, there were black people telling black folks, even under Jim Crow, that we complain too much, that we got more than we deserve. There were even people who argued that, you know, I brought in the book Black Judas. They said that we owe a debt to the United States, that the United States owes us nothing. And then you have people say, well, maybe we didn't get it in the 1880s and the 1890s, but we definitely got everything we had coming to us in the 1960s. And we didn't get it because of a bunch of northern races came to fight it, to slaughter a bunch of southern races. But when, you know, a bunch of good hearted white liberals joined with a bunch of nonviolent black Christians and peacefully and calmly made processions marched in Chicago and marched in Selma, Alabama and marched in Washington and held hands and sang Kumbaya and had dreams of little black boys and little white boys walking hand in hand. Some people really believe that is why black people got not just the writing down and ratification, but the enforcement, the ability to enforce our civil and human rights. They really believe that nonviolence, that a black man, Dr. King, who said he got his moral motivation from Jesus Christ, who doesn't exist, and got his tactical, his tactical abilities and his tactical inspiration from Mahatma Gandhi, an Indian racist who hated black people, who didn't even like all Indian people. He, hated, he wanted to maintain the caste system. At the same time, Gandhi was fighting to have the British colonialism purged. People begged him to speak out against the caste system, which he was very reluctant to do because he was from a higher caste. So he, he said, we want to end British oppression to return to Indian racist oppression. But that's who inspired Dr. King. And some people, so I, even we who celebrate who don't want to just who don't want to accept who deny a lot of black people deny that white people deliberately organize and deliberately subvert our interest they want to deny that and yes i say white people very you know when i want i i can be specific when i want to be or i could be less broad i could say white elites you know, I could say Zionist, I could say racist, white nationalist, neo-Nazis. But when you really look at subversion of black interest, when you look at uh, agendas like COINTELPRO, you'll find that there's a broad spectrum of white people involved in this. It isn't just right-wing evangelical white nationalist. If you look at the infrastructure of the CIA, and the FBI, even if you look at this most recent uh, Trump investigation with Mueller, there are a lot of progressive, a lot of liberal, a lot of forward thinking, a lot of secular, humanistic white people, good white people, non-racist white people involved in these schemes. In fact, much of the Cold War didn't just, the Cold War didn't just involve fighting the Russians. It involved preventing the spread of communism. And in, during the Cold War, communism was essentially anybody who wanted to do anything that was inconsistent with what the United States and Western Europe wanted. So, it, and, and what communism is, is, you know, giving the means of production over to the worker, ending private property, making a centralized planned economy. Uh, a communist, Marxist, socialist government. But there were many nations like Haiti, Nigeria, and many other nations that were not communist, 
that had no intention of ending private property rights, had absolutely no intentions of establishing communes, worker ownership of the means of production. They had no elements of communism or even socialism, but yet they were still subverted. Because the real trick was you can't do capitalism, socialism, or anarchism, or any other ism your own way. If you weren't taking your direct orders from DC, you were communist or terrorist or a dictator or a madman or a cannibal. They call you whatever they want to come in and get you right. So anyway, I don't think we understand we have an in-depth enough understanding of oppression and subversion. And I don't think we even understand what we celebrate when Kwanzaa's coming up, Dr. King's birthday is coming up, Black History Month is coming up. We just left Black August. And y'all Juneteenth, I don't understand what's to celebrate about Juneteenth, but Juneteenth, we have all of these historical recognitions. And I think those should be times of, of reflection and times of celebration, but also times of in-depth study and planning and coordination. But that's me. And maybe that's why I don't get invited to a lot of y'all. Back in the day, I used to. A few years ago, I used to get invited to come speak at Kwanzaa's events and these Black History events. I used to get a lot of invites to come speak. But people, I've literally had people stand up and tell me, I came here to feel good about myself. I came here to get to have pride and to celebrate my ancestors. I didn't come here for this. To be made to feel bad, to make to, to be made to feel pessimistic. And I understand. I didn't even argue. I don't even argue with that. I'm not even going to beef with you. Oh, anyway, somebody's asking me what, what songs I was praying. <laughs> My bad. Um, let me let me name. Uh, let, let's go back. Let's back it up a little bit. I started off because, again, today is the Tanzanian Independence Day. And depending on how you define Tanzania, depending on how you chart the history of the nation, some say December 9th. 1964. I say December 9, 1964, but they were saying that, you know, there were regions of Tanzania before Zamb Zanzibar was incorporated and united because Tan Tanzania is actually the fusion of two, two uh, nations into one. Uh, some say as early as 1961, uh, the territory of Tanzania had, had beat off the British, got those British parasites off their back. But again, Tanzania, like all other, I can't even say, I was going to say most of her, but like all other African nations went from colonization to neo-colonization or what Dr. Clark called flag independence. You have your own flag, you have your own black leaders, you got black behinds in, in the legislatures and the parliaments and the president and prime minister, you got all these black people in positions of power and they begin to carry out the exact same extraction economics of colonialism that the Europeans left in place. There's literally, literally, there are some African nations that the British uh, colonial officer stood up and stepped out of the seat and the African elected officials sat down in the seat and continued the exact same work as the British colonial office. But anyway, you asked me, what songs did I play this morning? First, I played um, the British national, um, I'm sorry, I got, I'm, I'm just, I can't say the word British on the air, it just occupies my mind. But anyway, I played the Tanzanian national anthem. That was the first song that I played. And when, when I remember to, it's not consistent enough, when we come up on a Caribbean or African um, Independence Day and some now like Guyana, some, some, when we come upon a black nations, a black country, Independence Day, I like to, to play their national anthem. So we played the Nigerian national anthem, the Jamaican and, and Trinidad, Tobago, um, 
Tanzania, of course, South African. But anyway, Independence Day National Anthem. So I started the morning off with the Tanzanian National Anthem, which is a beautiful song, short and sweet. That was followed by uh, Raj Mtubu. Uh, let me just, I'm going to have to sound this out. My Yankee tongue is going to have a little trouble with this. But his name was Raj Ntam Dan Shikua. In Tambashikua, Ras and Tambashikua, and the song was called Turn Back. And then followed that, I played, which is a, what probably, as far as I know, one of the most uh, well known Tanzanian roots artists, um, Phantom Ranks. That's Phantom Ranks, um, and the song was Unite. I have a couple of more um, Tanzanian uh, music, some, some uh, old some new um and it's kind of curious because in a lot of the anti-colonial struggles there's quite a bit of music and, and and coming out of the struggle but tanzania relatively was one of the more stable transitions from colonial to african rulership it, it, ha it hasn't had the the reoccurring coup d'etats and internal stability that have plagued other African nations in the post-colonial era. But I don't want to step on because one of the most famous African uh, statecrafts, one of the famous African decolonizers and African scholars and African heads of state, jo uh, Julius Nyeri, I have an interview by him. So I, I don't want to start talking about what he's going to talk about because he could say it better than me. So I want to share that before we go off the air. So I, I don't have much time. So I want to talk about some other things. Let's just jump straight to the topic because I do want to share some more Tanzanian uh, music. And I do want to share, in, in, to the best of my ability, the, um, so I'm just going to run through the topic and, and get to that interview because I really want to share that. So if you're listening to Bro Diallo's show, you definitely want to listen at Q4 Radio, AM 1680, the iTunes app, um, and Q4.org, or the TuneIn app. Or I think those are the, the, the best sources to find Q4 Radio because if you want to hear the, the Nayeri uh, video and, and, and hear the totality of the Bro Diallo show, um, you definitely want to listen to Q4.org if you're not in the city of Chicago, uh, city of Chirac, state of Illinois. Oh, one of the artists, um, yesterday in the airport, we had a uh, probably currently one of the biggest artists, contemporary artists out of Chicago, he actually went to the same high school as my wife, graduate, I mean, years after. He was only 21. But uh, Juice World, and I, and it's weird because Juice, my son, was, was debating whether or not he could go to this Juice World concert. He was planning on going to see Juice World in the new year here. Um, and uh, he died in the airport of a seizure. And uh, initially they said that he had a seizure when they, when the, when the uh, first responders, when the paramedics got to um, the Chicago airport, they said that he was bleeding profusely from the mouth and nose. But now they're saying it, that it was a seizure. But now today, after the medical examiner is reporting that he did have cardiac arrest or myocardial infarction, he died of a heart attack at 21 years old. And the... Uh, Investigator on the case, the Chicago Police Department and medical examiner is saying that they don't suspect any foul play of this young man, but they also didn't say what the specific cause of death beyond cardiac arrest. And we don't know if he had any congenital diagnosed heart disease. We don't know if it was drugs. We don't know. But there's a lot of speculation. But what's funny to me is because on social media, um, Juice World. When when I saw the announcement, actually my son was in his room and my wife called him down, and said, "You know, Juice World. They just announced that Juice World was dead yesterday morning." And he was like, "No, he didn't take it as hard as he thought." I even said to my wife, "Why would you just blurt that out?" I mean, he he listens to this guy. That's some artists, and I just know some artists that I took personal in my youth. If somebody had called me down at 15, 16 years old and was like, uh, KRS One is dead, or Wise Intelligent, or the whole the plane carrying Fishbone had 
falling into the Atlantic. I don't know. I'd probably have passed out. But I guess my son, he took it well. He felt it was sad, but he took it more as a cautionary tale, actually, for him. That's how he took it. He, he, he was down a little bit. But I've seen a lot of people talking about, oh, these young people and their drugs. I don't know if it's drugs. I really don't know. Or it could be a combination of things. But, I mean, people my age, us in our 40s and our 50s, we need to really, really fall back. Even you boomers, even you people in your 70s and 80s, fall back. As if you never heard of Charlie Bird Parker or all the other jazz artists that, that died of heroin. And even us, us slightly younger, y'all ain't heard of Jimi Hendrix. All, every, every generation had its drug of choice. It's weird fashion, it's sexual exploration, and losing its artist at, at a premature, it's rising artist at the height of their creative development. There's really no criticism we can level against young people that wouldn't apply to us. And that's all I'm saying. So even if you want to critique or talk about cautionary tales and critique the youth, understand this ain't that the young people ain't invented nothing and y'all love to tell young people how they haven't invented anything when they come up with or create something that they're proud of like we got this fashion we got this lingo we got this this instrument we got this this artistry we got these things we did Oh, no, that ain't nothing new. We was doing that in the 70s. That ain't nothing but the doo-wop. That ain't nothing but the diddy bop. You ain't doing nothing. You ain't got nothing. We always tell young people they haven't done anything. But then, when, so when it's something negative, we want to act like it's out of nowhere. Oh, these babies having babies? Oh, these, these artists doing and promoting drugs? All these artists, they don't respect life. They're just dying at a young age. Let me tell you something. Artists old since the era of the juke joint since the blues era since the era of prohibition young artists have been tragically lost to us these stars that burn so bright and burn out so all i want to say is if you're my age or older watch your damn mouth that's really what it amounts to watch your mouth and think about what the hell you're saying because there are some young people that really took this guy I could, I know, I, I can't say I couldn't name a song. I know that song, Lucid Dream. But I know he was hot in the streets. Some young people are going to be really traumatized. And some of y'all going to be like, what y'all crying for? He wasn't nothing. He was no Michael Jackson. He was no Prince. You know, he was no bold jangles. I mean, I don't even know what y'all going to say. And, I, and it's just kind of this, this unnecessary generational ins insensitivity. This, and I know Bro Diallo talking about insensitivity. You know, by the time I'm saying it, you know it's got to be bad. I'm just saying, watch your mouth, be mindful, be respectful. That's all I'm saying. Be a good example. And be aware that I can go to your era. I can go to your era of music, your era of fashion. You know, and I just kind of get sick. We're coming up in the new year, and when the spring comes, the young men are going to be going out to prom, and there's this one macho man that, that goes, literally, he scours the internet for young men, young black males, dressed in what he deems to be inappropriate prom dresses or prom suits, outlandish and often genderqueer prom suits. And he shares them on social media as evidence of the erosion and utter destruction of our black youth, black male youth, and black male masculinity. And I'm like, first of all, what could be more quote unquote feminine than a man so militantly and 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 restlessly scouring the internet for high fashion? <laughs> and I point this out to him and I'm like, Look at he, and he and he has these commentaries like look at these young black quote unquote males that are raised by single mothers and he's just got all these theories he don't know any of these boys and he's got all these theories as to why they're wearing a pink suit or they've got frills or or they you know just these all these weird outfits and he has all these theories about their, their parentage, whether or not their father was present, and their identities, their sexualities, from this one picture. 
And I say, what is more, and you talk about this is a feminine, by your standard, I said, what is more feminine than a grown ass man in his late forties critiquing teenage boys prom suits? I mean, it, I mean, you don't you don't see a contradiction there. So of course, and then of course he attacks my identity and masculinity, which is I'm ready for that, whatever. But it's just weird to me. But anyway, at that same time, I would when was in his feed. A couple of years, I did this, and I went to his era, the era where men were men. And I showed him all these images of menly men from that era, dressed in provocative ways, just in ways that challenged or upended gender norms or standards. Every man in the 1950s was not wearing brogue iron shoes and overalls and didn't carry an ax. We weren't all John Henry's. There were men that wore lace and perfume back then, and it didn't destroy us. And I don't think it's going to destroy anybody. This, but people, I get a lot of pushback on that. A lot of brothers want to believe this fantasy that black masculinity or masculinity in general. They don't. It ain't even black masculinity. They want to lock arms with these white boys, and and form a barrier. And men want to go their own way. And <laughs> and then they say, black masculinity is under attack. So then they form a movement called Man, Go Your Own Way, which is basically this utopian dream of men coming together to the exclusion of women and maybe going off to some, you know, utopian village somewhere of just men being manly men and no girly men allowed. There's going to be all these robust, muscular men, masculine men away from who have gone their own way, who have separated themselves from society and men. It's going to be nothing but masculine, muscular, robust manliness, altogether isolated away from this this uh, feminist, female dominated society. I'm like, wow. How come homophobia always tends to, the, the more in depth you go into homophobia, you find homoeroticism. You always end up right back. <laughs> it, uh, that's, that's a loop. It's weird to me. The manliest homophobic behaviors always come off as homoerotic if you take the time to look at it, but I don't know, I have to digress. I didn't went from Tanzanian independence to occult homoeroticism, and, and I'm gonna bring it back. Uh, this is Q4 Radio, AM 1680. Uh, happy Tanzanian Independence Day. Uh, whether you're Tanzanian or not, these, those are our brothers. And uh, shout out to Julius Nayiri, a true Pan-Africanist and not perfect, like a lot of uh, African post-colonial leaders, very complex figure. But I do believe he's one of the few who were sincere. And even if you don't want to believe that Nayiri was sincere in Pan-Africanism, let me tell you, the British colonial government was believed he was sincere. The MI6 the CIA believed and the US government and the uh, Western multinational corporations all believed he was sincere because they deployed agents and implemented agendas to subvert him. So if you don't believe he was sincere, the enemies of our people believed he was sincere and that he was an actual threat. And that's a good transition. And today's show is called Unfit to Rule, the Immorality of integration. And I just wanted to speak on this um, because uh, we just coming out of the G7 summit and the NATO summit and the climate summit. And we have all of these powerful white nations coming together, basically trying to determine how the world would be governed. They're doing an assessment of the current state of the world, and they are determining how to advance forward. And out of over 200 nations across the world, there are only seven that are truly allowed to make that determination. Whether you look at the G7 summit 
whether you look at NATO, whether you look at the permanent members of the UN Security Council. The world is under a Western dictatorship, the entire planet. These people told us between 1950s, really between the 1940s, between the 1948 all the way up into 1994, that they were protecting us from the darkness of communism. Up until 1994, Europe, the United States, Australia, Canada, oh, also Japan, were called the free world. And they and the president of the United States, I believe, still is called by some circles, some old heads, some baby boomers, the leader of the free world. And the unfree world was or the so-called Warsaw Pact were the Eastern Communist powers and their agent states or client states, their colonies. So the free world had promised that it had to engage in assassination, espionage, military occupation, invasion, uh, blockades, and sanctions in order to protect the free world from communism. And the reason they had to protect the free world from communism is because communism would take away our individuality, our freedom. If you looked at movies back then, there were movies like It and The Blob. There were a lot of, and the monsters during the Cold World era were monsters that would occupy your body and take away your identity, the, in, the, the invasion of the body snatchers. The free world, the United States and its allies, during the, from the 1940s up until the early 1990s, said that we would lose our identity, we would lose our individuality, we would lose our freedom, our, and our, mainly our freedom to choose personal choice, individual choice, even our individual autonomy and, and identity if we were to come into communism. And there is an entire list, library of movies that show some otherworldly force, some ancient threat or some outer space threat or some foreign threat, some alien threat that would come into our bodies and not only take away are over, but make our behaviors align with everyone else. Or turn us into an amorphous mob, something that has no true form, no true shape, no true culture, no true freedom. And once you're engulfed in the blob, or once the it takes over your body, it will mangle you, it will twist you into what it wants you to be instead of you determining for yourself what you should be. And once the blob takes you, the blob, go back and look at those old blob movies. The blob is communism. And you'll see people who get caught up in the blob were people who were simple-minded. People who didn't listen to the warnings. The people who were too relaxed or too comfortable. And the, and the, and the antagonist or the, or the hero of the movie would come up and say, you got to run, you got to fight, you got to hide, you got to do something. And people were like, oh, you're just flapping your gums. You, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Get out of my face. I'm going to sit here and do nothing. I'm just going to sit on this couch and not be vigilant, not be aware. And that's how the communists get you because you don't believe there's a communist threat. Because if you don't believe there's a communist threat, you're not going to support the wars, the sanctions, the, the taxation to build up a war and, and to build an aircraft carrier to go overseas. You're not going to support the invasion of Vietnam, the invasion of Laos and Cambodia and the incursions and the overthrow of Salvador Allende. If you don't believe there's a threat, that means everything the United States did in the post-World War II era, all of the invasions, assassinations, the murders, the subversions, if you don't believe that the blob is at your door, then that means the United States is lying to you, that, that, that the United States is the bad guy, and all of this is for some other insidious agenda as opposed to protecting democracy and freedom. 
And so this is a very interesting era that we don't give enough attention to. I don't hear us talking about the Cold War enough. We are products of the Cold War. The current world shaping is a product of the Cold War. The unipolar world was given birth to out of the flames of the bipolar world of communism versus capitalism. Now we find out that communism was never the threat that they said it was. There was no evidence. Uh, the, the Soviet Union during its dissolution, they found that they had this era of, of what was called glasnost. And during glasnost, they went around uh, the Soviet Union and tore down all the communist monuments, statues of Marx, statues of Lenin, all things in Stalin. Anything that represented the old world, they, 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 they shut down Lenin's tomb and they finally buried Lenin because Lenin was kept in a mummified state so you can go and view, view Lenin's body. They were like, all of this, we're not going to celebrate that time and we're going to denounce the, the crimes of Stalin and the crimes of the communists and the Bolshevik party. We're going we're gonna to denounce that era. We're going to apologize to the Tsar. We're going to resurrect the Tsar and Tsarist Russia and, and, the, and the mythology of the Tsar being a benevolent ruler. They said, we're going to change all of this. But what they found during that Glasnost era was not a just a decommunization of, of, of the Soviet Union and Russia, but it was also an era of revealing where all the secret of this communist state, of the KGB and the Stasi in Central Europe, they said, we're going to give up all the documents. We're going to have, they basically had a truth and reconciliation era, which was called glasnost, which is glass, see-through. We're going to reveal the truths. And in that era, yeah, there was talk of, of spying and poisoning and attacking the enemies of the communist state. But there was also another thing. They found out that there was no real evidence of a global communist conspiracy. The thing that NATO was formed to protect us from, the thing that caused the United States to build the biggest military, the thing that, that provoked the United States to build that we know of, over 20,000 massive nuclear warheads, nuclear submarines, nuclear power, aircraft carriers to invade all of these countries to, to, to build up right-wing militias from South America to Africa to overthrow Haitian democracy, Jamaican democracy. Even to call them to have a COINTELPRO because we also COINTELPRO believe that there was communist infiltration into black power and black liberation organizations in the United States. They even said that Dr. Martin Luther King was controlled by the communists. That means all of that was a lie. Literally trillions of dollars and millions of lives lost on a lie. On a lie. But then there's the even greater lie that affects us directly. Because maybe some of y'all don't care. Some of my listeners weren't even alive during the Cold War. Or they didn't even reach adulthood. Many of you. I wasn't even an adult. When the, when the wall fell during the, the first Bush, Bush 1.0 administration, I was still in school. I wasn't even old enough to vote. When the Berlin Wall came down. And, and, and uh, the Russia went from an empire to a nation, went from, uh, really it was authoritarian capitalism, but whatever. What they call cap, uh, capitalism, I mean communism to a capitalist free market system. I wasn't even a full-on adult, and many people weren't even born in the early 90s. But what was said after that? The free world said, now, now that the communist threat was over, because no white communist, because China was still the most populous nation in the world, and they were still identified as communists. They self-identified as communists. They're not communists. If you look at what the definition of communism is, and you look at how China actually functions, the red Chinese Communist Party is not 
communist. They don't practice. They're no more communist than America is democratic. But I digress. Let's just go with that. But they said communism is no longer a threat. The Iron Curtain has been pulled back. Um, Reagan said the evil empire. Now, I'm getting to a point with this, but you, we got to know these backstories sometimes. But anyway, George Bush, Herbert Walker Bush, went before when he had his one term as president after Ronald Reagan, Ronnie the Reagan, and said, we have a new world order. And this sent a lot of people into a tizzy because people have been talking about the new world order since the 1920s. Books like Pawns in the Game, you know, Conspirators Hierarchy and the Committee of 300, tri Trilateralism. People have been talking about a new world order, but this was supposed to be a secret cabal, the Illuminati. So to have a president a seated president in office get up and say in a, in a worldwide press conference, we're bringing about a new world order. That just sent a lot of people into a tailspin. And they started to say, oh, it's a conspiracy. But let me tell you something. In that context, a conspiracy by nature has to be secret. If someone's on national TV saying, I'm doing this, it's no longer a conspiracy. It's an agenda. It's a plan. So if I huddle up in a corner somewhere and say, hey, bro, let's do this. Don't tell anybody. Yeah, we're going to do this in secret. It's a conspiracy. But if I put out a press release saying, hey, we about to do this, that's an agenda. And I know y'all don't like to call things agenda because conspiracy is a much more sexy world, word. And if you can go around telling people about conspiracies, then you seem more enlightened than you simply talking about agendas. So the moment Bush, even and not that it was ever an Illuminati conspiracy, but the moment George W. Bush stood on a global stage and said, we're bringing about, about a new world order, it was no longer a conspiracy. But anyway, it was a project. It was an agenda. But he said there will be a thousand points of light because George H.W. Bush said, the trillions of dollars that we spent fighting cap communism can now be reoriented. We can build schools, we can build hospitals, we can even engage in nation building. We can build up the former colonies, all of the nations that fell to the dark specter of communism. We can bring them into the free world and make sure they become democratic nations that give all of their citizens freedom. And we will teach American consumerism and it will be a, a place that's run by the market. And nothing's more democratic than the market because the market is all about supply and demand. What the people want, the market will provide. And if you refuse to provide what the people want, then you will go out of business and someone else will take your place that can speak to the needs of the consumers. And what do we have? From 1994 to 2020, what world did the unilateral communism, communism came to dominate because even China said, we're going to become the manufacturing base of the capitalist economy. So China went capitalist, Russia went capitalist. There is literally no, so there are some socialist parties and some communist organizations. Even in the United States, you have the revolutionary communist party, but there are no official communist nations anywhere even though China is ruled by a, a communist party, that doesn't mean that they are governing as communists. Just like the Republican, Republicans means rule of law. But if you look at the Republican Party, they have absolutely no respect for constitutional, constitutional uh, law, constitutional traditions and practices. They don't give a damn about the rule of the law. So the Communist Party is no more communist of, of Red China than the Socialist Party, I mean the Republican Party is Republican. Or even the Democratic Party is Democratic because the, most, the majority of the Democratic Party favor single payer health care. They pay, uh, favor uh, reduction, if not elimination, elimination of student debt. And all these things that upwards of the 70 to 80 percent of the Democratic Party members support, the, 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 sm the small minority of party funders don't, don't uh, follow through with the desires of the majority. So the Democratic Party is not Democratic. The Republican Party is not law-abiding. It's not rule of law. So you can look at a name, but you can also look at practices. And if practices are inconsistent with the title, then you have to go with practices over time. 
So anyway, in this new world, where all nations, because you had this in, in the aligned nation, the United States and the other Western powers had the aligned nations and the non-aligned nations. The aligned nations are the nations that, is, uh, that support privatization, that they set their economy up for export, wage economy. Um, they shunned nationalization of, of infrastructure, nationalization of natural resources, all of that. And even though the people had no say over the economy, there was no democratic control of the economy, as long as you had democratic elections so the people were able to lawfully elect who will facilitate the rape of their country by the capitalists, that was enough. And so all nations began to align. And the only holdout was what? North Korea and to a lesser extent Libya, Iraq. You had Haiti tried to go with the lava loss and tried to go socialist. But they had it on lock. They even called this time the end of history. There will be no more major conflicts, no more major wars, because the whole world is basically on one system. And people were even saying there's going to be one world government, one world currency. The new world order is going to make everybody get on the same page. And some people said this is a catastrophe. Some people said this is something we should celebrate because it will reduce starvation, hunger, conflict. And now we see just like the communist threat, the specter of communism coming to steal and rob us, not just of our freedoms, but our very self-identity. We found that that was a lie. And now we see what George Bush called the New World Order, the thousand points of light, what he called the peace dividend, was also a lie. Because even though there's no communist threat, we have more war, more conflict, more instability, more overthrows and coup d'etats, more assassinations, more poverty, starvation, instability under a New World Order than we had under the the Cold War era. During the Cold War era, when I was a child, we used to have drills. We used to have tornado drills, blood drills, and nuclear drills. You could walk around places like New York and see these signs for fallout shelters, which means if you heard the sirens go out, that means the Russians have launched the bomb. And you were, these were, they, they had signs of saying, hey, if there's a nuclear bomb coming, you can go into these places. Some of them were in, in, in public areas. Some of them were in pi private buildings. When I was living in uh, Turner Towers in Brooklyn, they had a fallout shelter. And they would have these nuclear bombing drills where children would get under the desk and cover their heads, put their heads between their legs and, 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 and interlock their hands over their heads. None of this would save us from a nuclear bomb. But they wanted us, it wasn't to truly protect us from a nuclear bomb. It was to gin up the threat. Walking down the street, going about your days, picking daisies and whatnot. And you would see this fallout shelter with the nuclear logo on it just to remind you hey if you ever think about joining a leftist party or a socialist party or you think about going against the status quo boom there's a bomb shelter here because you're supporting the communists you're bringing us to the brink of nuclear annihilation it's the same thing in new york you walk around new york and they have these signs be vigilant vigilant if you see an unattended bag call somebody you go on the subway and you have these transit officers that used to just carry knife, wooden nightsticks and six-shooter 38s. Now got mach automatic machine gun and military dogs and they got on full military vest and flak armor. And they're there to watch for terrorists. And it's crazy because I was living in New York during the, the uh, World Trade Center bombing. Hell, I went to Manhattan to see what the hell was going on on that day of tw in 2011. And guess what? All of the policies they implemented in New York City at that time, all of the surveillance, none of that, even if they, none, none of the policies would have prevented what happened. None of that. How is having a, a, a armored uh, fascist in the subway tunnel 
going to prevent planes from crashing into a building. And if you ever fly into LaGuardia, and I advise you don't take pictures of these people because they can take you into custody because they can say, well, you're taking pictures in order to set up an attack. So you, if you got business to take care of, but if you come to LaGuardia and you exit LaGuardia Airport, they got tanks and armored vehicles. They're not there to protect you from terrorists. They're there to keep you in a mind state of perpetual threat. And so the G7 and NATO, the, U, the permanent members of the UN Security Council, are coming together to the meetings because a lot of people are figuring this out. I'm not that smart. There are a lot of people who have figured this out. The Cold War, the, the, the peace dividend, the post-Cold World uh, War era, the global capitalist system is illegitimate. It's trash. NATO is illegitimate. The G7 is a global dictatorship. And the UN Security Council, instead of creating security, creates global instability for the private enrichment of a few 1% of the global population. And the real purpose of the capitalist system is not to give people individual treat, uh, freedom and, and consumer options, but the real purpose of all of these international IMF, World Bank, NATO, these global organizations, is to maintain the status quo of extracting the wealth from the global majority and putting the wealth and power in the hands of a global minority. And so you have uprising in France, you have uprisings in Spain, Venezuela, Portugal, Nigeria. There's rumblings even in communist China. You got uh, um, everything from, from the uprisings and, and, and peasant uprisings, urban and rural uprisings. So now, but they don't have anything. They can't call all the, of these people terrorists. You can't call white people in Paris, white Christians, Protestants and Catholics rising up in Paris, you can't call them terrorists. You can't call Catalonians, well they do call them, I ain't gonna say that, but nobody's gonna believe that Christian Catalonians in Spain are terrorists or Portuguese laborers are terrorists. So now they're coming together trying to figure out, wow, you know, we were so successful Really, these first world nations are victims of their own success. They've impoverished the world. They've encirculated the world. They have the whole world system of, 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 of uh, global system of surveillance. And people are like, even the people in denial, even the people who don't pay attention in history or politics are realizing something's wrong. Even when they send us, they give us this, this neoliberal Pete Buttigieg, and they give us uh, Cory Booker, and they give us Kamala Harris, Kamala. And the people are rejecting these neoliberal center-left politicians. Even the election of Trump was a right-wing rebellion. That's the thing. The left, I am a leftist. I am a far radical leftist. The other end of the political spectrum, the right wing, they also engage in rebellions and protests and revolutions. People only think the, the hippie or the libtards or whatever the right wing says are the only people. But Trump's election was a right wing rebellion. Now, it was a self-defeating rebellion. It was a stupid rebellion, but it was a rebellion against the status quo of the right. And now you have a left wing. But the thing about it is, the left wing is a little harder to manipulate. The right wing, you have to be an idiot to be a right winger, to be a working class right winger. I'm sorry, I don't want to offend all white wingers. If you are a multimillionaire, a corporatist, an elite right winger, it is immoral, but it is rational for you to be on the right wing because it preserves your status. Conservatism, you want to conserve the world order. But if you're a poor working class, right winger, you are an idiot. And all of the luxuries and comforts you enjoy as a poor or working class right winger are the result of left wing struggles.
And you are dumb because you don't understand the processes that brought you the comfort that you have. So when you're balling out and when you're shopping at Walmart, or if you're really balling and you're shopping at Target, and you're able to pay your car note and pay your utility bills on time, and you have some level of stable income and work, that is a purely result of left-wing struggle. It had no right-winger gave that to you, and for and you're subverting your own. So even though it was a stupid, idiotic, backwards, self-defeating rebellion, it was a rebellion nonetheless. And the globe holders, population controllers, as wise, intelligent, a poor righteous teachers calls them, the globe holders, which I like that term, and I love that song. But they understand the mask off. I like that song less, but mask off, as Future said, or as I say in my own way, the velvet glove has been taken off of the iron fist. People are seeing capitalism and Western democracy for the lies that they are. Capitalism is not a based on your merit. You, you're willing to sacrifice, put in hard work, and your hard work and sacrifice will be rewarded with material wealth. And if you can own your own property and you can save and you can invest intelligently, then you will be rewarded. There are a whole bunch of people that saved and worked diligently and invested properly and got wiped out by a bunch of crooks who faced, it, who faced no sanctions from the government, thanks to Obama. And so that now that they realize this, the G7 is working hard to say, how do we upend the rebellion? And there are some people saying, we can stop the worldwide rebellion and worldwide discontent by simply giving some of our money back to the people we stole it from. Some of the billionaires and trillion dollar corporations, well, instead of saying being a multi-billionaire, you might just have to be a billionaire. Instead of $100 billion, you might have to settle for 3 or $4 billion. And that is the minority of the elite. But there are some billionaire elite who say, listen, we have to give some of this money back because they outnumber us 100 million to one. There's not enough of us. And even and, and you're either going to pay or give the money back to the citizens so that they can live lives of dignity, or you're going to have to spend all your billions of dollars on security infrastructure. Or like Jeff Bezos says, I'm not giving the money back. I will build a rocket ship and go fly and build a Mars colony before I give this money back to these people. And they don't have the money to follow me to Mars. That's a few voices. There are a few voices of saying tax the risk. There are some billionaires on the left. They're not leftist billionaires. They just have some leftist positions that say we have to, through taxation and other redistributive methods, give the money back to the rest of the, the masses. Not all the money back, but give them enough money to take them away from the get gates. We don't want the guillotine. There are other billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg, like the Koch brothers, who say, we ain't giving back a dime. Jeff Bezos, we ain't coming off nothing. Or as Wise Intelligence said, they ain't turning down nothing but their collars. <laughs> and so their plan is, we're going to have more intensive surveillance. So every time if a career, so you got the people, the amorphous blob, you got the people that they want to rebel against the system by voting for people like Trump, who are products and servants of the system. But they talk dirty, they talk slick. But don't you can't I can't really dish the Trumpers because it's saying like a lot of black men in this country love Mugabe because Mugabe would get in front of a microphone and get behind a podium and say some really off color things. He would call British leaders fags and punks and threaten them and say, hey, you come here, we'll kick your ass. And black men in the United States was like, hell yeah, go Mugabe. But then as soon as you could get Mugabe behind a closed door away from a microphone and the Chinese and the British and all these other foreign powers are like, sign over your assets. And he signed on the dotted line. And then he get back in the same thing Trump does. Trump gets in front of a microphone. Yeah, we're going to America first. We're going to put America first. And then he flies to Saudi Arabia and he's wearing a turban and dancing around the saber. <laughs> Them hoes ain't loyal. Them hoes are not loyal. So, 
Some people say we're going to have increased surveillance. We're going to do more intensive indoctrination. Hell, we'll let them smoke weed and, and, and lay out on their porches. Smoked out. We'll even legalize drugs and let them all get high into oblivion. And this is the majority of the elites. And they say we have enough weapons to, 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 over, to stop any uprising. As long as the uprisings are sporadic and misdirected, and if you if, if, if ever a charismatic leader that can guide or direct a rebellion, we'll nip them in the bud. We'll nip them in the bud. We'll assassinate them. We'll poison them. Hell, we'll do like we did Hugo Chavez, and we'll give him cancer and make it look like, oh, he's just an unfortunate victim of a random disease. And, that, and, then, and pretty soon we're going to have ethno-specific pandemics. We're going to put, uh, uh, they just say, say, we're going to create, turn the world into a, uh, a global prison playground. And so those are the two factions within the elites. And none of them are consulting us. Even the leftist billionaires, quote unquote, I hate using that term, but what, what do you want from me? I'm trying to keep it simple. And the right, far right billionaires. The leftist billionaires say we can remain billionaires, but we do have to kick a little back down to the peasants. The other people say, no, we're going to bleed the peasants till they die. And when the peasants are all dead, we'll have artificial intelligent robots that can pleasure us, that can drive our trucks and do everything, raise our children and even perform surgery for us. We don't need the chattel. We don't need the goyim. We don't need these human resources anymore. Now, the real unfortunate thing is, and to get me to the title, why Im Im integration is immoral. Number one, these billionaires are unfit to rule. There is no one who has earned or worked for a billion dollars. There is no one who has done a billion dollars worth of work. So every billionaire and every multimillionaire is a thief, is a scam artist, is a criminal. And so, we have black people who want to be fully engaged with this system, who want to fully enter this system, this corrupt, decaying, ineffective, unsustainable system. And we still crawling up on the year 2020 saying we want our full rights in America. And the reason we want our full rights in America, because those full rights will give us an opportunity to reach the heights of American elitism. We want our rights. We want banks to stop discriminating against us. We want property and real estate to end property and real estate discrimination. We want to be able to fully exercise our votes and direct public policy. And the, but the ultimate end to that is so that we can have more Oprah Winfrey's, Michael Jordans. We're not fighting to get our rights so that we can bring true justice to the world. We're fighting for our rights to bring opportunities to individuals. And that is a zero-sum game. Because let's say all racism ended tomorrow. And black people, in proportion to our numbers in this country, is the level of wealth we were able to control and hold in this country. Let's say black people have full racial justice in America. That does not in any way stop ecocide, and the destruction of the ecosystem and destruction of the life-sustaining capacity of the earth, that does not end imperialism and militarism. Because if you end imperial and militarism, then the very currency of the U.S. fiat dollar begins to collapse. Because the fiat dollar is a petrol dollar. And the petrol system is rooted in colonialism. So if the United States had to pay market rates for Saudi Arabian uh, uh um, Iranian and Nigerian and Venezuelan oil, if they were able to control their own oil and be sovereign, then the petrol dollar would collapse. So if black people want equality in America, black people have to become imperialist or at the least have passive support for imperialism, genocide, ecocide, resource extraction, uh, sanctions and blockades. Because if you don't support those things, you are going to collapse capitalism. And how do you want to collapse the system that you're trying to get up in, trying to elevate in? 
So it's no different than as you enter a house and go live in the high rise of the house. At the same time, you claim you want to destroy the foundations of that house or that high rise. It makes no sense. So you can't be integrationist and pro-black. You can't be integrationist and pro uh Africa or pro humanity or even pro survival of your children and grandchildren. Then we're fighting, that's why we are so unsuccessful. Because when we win, we lose. When we succeed in ca capitalism and we get a Byron Allen or a LeBron James, or and they come and like they talk about these black people going to Africa to set up schools. Little John is in Ghana setting up schools. Serena Williams is in is setting up schools. And 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 uh, what's his name? LeBron James is going to poor communities to set up schools. And nobody ever mentions why is this community so damn poor that they need a damn celebrity to come open a school? Why don't they have the proper governance and the proper resources and the proper infrastructure to open their own damn schools? Where did the money go? That because there were schools here before. Why aren't there schools here now? Nobody looks at that. And nobody even asks, can we look at the curriculum of these schools? What the hell are you teaching these kids? You set up a wonderful school. Are you teaching them to perpetuate the system that made them impoverished and where they would need a celebrity to fund their education in the first damn place? Is anybody asking? I ask, but people call me a hater, so they don't answer me. They just attack me. So in order to be integrated, and, you know, I want to call this the Im immorality of integration and reparations. But I didn't want to have that fight. But if reparations is about elevating African people into the system of oppression, then it is also a betrayal. We need viable alternatives. We need to stand in principled and practical opposition to the systems and institutions of capitalism, global white domination, imperialism, militarism, and consumerism. We need an ecological socialistic economy. We need to put ecology above economy. We need to encapsulate our economic development within the natural ecosystems. We need to understand that being a human resource is no different than being a wage slave. We need global revolution. We need Pan-Africanism. All of these things are an anathema to integration. Integration is immoral and reparations for the purpose of integration and further entrenching African people and giving African people more opportunities within capitalism is also immoral and ultimately set, set to fail. And not only should it fail, it's going to fail, but we deserve to fail. We have to be radical. Radical means seed. It means root. It means origins. We have to be radical, meaning that we have to look at the root. We can't just look at the surface or the outcome of things. Little John, Serena Williams ain't going to save a damn thing. They can't even save themselves. And these acts of charities, these acts of charity is no different than an abusive husband coming home with a bouquet of flowers after he's beat you to a bloody pulp. And he gives you a bouquet of flowers and put some salve on your wombs and rub your feet and tell you it doesn't matter that your eye is black and your lip is split open. You're still the most beautiful woman in the world to him. And all of that relief that they give us or the relief that they send their token Negroes to give us is nothing more than to set us up for more abuse in the near future. Anyway, I got to play this Joseph Nairi. I ain't got much time left. This is Q4 Radio, Bro Diallo Show. Please subscribe to the YouTube. Please become a Patreon supporter. Please make a donation and contribute if you can help to keep the Bro Diallo Show on air. If you value pan-African, non-corporate, non-commercial radio and analysis. Again, Q4 Radio, AM 1680, tune in at iTunes Radio, and of course, Q4.org. Also, DialoKenyatta.com, at Diallo Kenyatta on Twitter. And again, you know, do I have to say uh, 
subscribe and all that. We, we know the routine. Support if you care. Support if you think it's valuable. Share it. Even if you don't like it, share it so y'all can mock me. Go share the Bro Diallo show so you and the rest of your uh, 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 sellout Uncle Tom, Raccoon, Negroes can um, mock me and tear me down. Go ahead, listen to my words, and see if you can find all of the contradictions and holes in my positions and arguments. Go out and pull out your, your, your propaganda, and, and let, let's do this. Let's see. Because I do accept that revolution is an intellectual, scholarly endeavor. More so than it is a military. Your, your scholarship in terms of revolution is of more value. Man, let me just say, shout out to Nayeri. Shout out to Tanzania. Happy Tanzanian Independence Day. Let us celebrate together. A victory for one is a victory for all, and a victory for all is your victory. Pan-Africanism or perish. Brody Allo Show. And we're going to share uh, Bagamayo spirit. Uh, Kipizi. That's another uh, Tanzanian patriotic song. <laughs> And then after the song, we'll have a, a brief interview with, with, with the father of Tanzanian decolonization, Pan-Africanism, and independence, Julius Nairi. <laughs>